Okay, I, I want to thank everybody for coming today. I'm, I've had, I have the distinct pleasure of being on stage with Roz Chast, okay? Uh, and, and I want to open with two quick things. One, um, I've been executive director here since 2011, and I just told this to Roz about, what, 20 minutes ago or something like that? So when I took over as executive director, the very first person I thought of to have as a special guest at SPX was Roz. And I didn't, you know, because she had never been a special guest at any comics festival before. And, and I thought it was an egregious oversight. Mm -hmm. And so I can't begin to tell you how happy I am to sit here seven years later that she's back. Yeah. So um, but before we get into... Roz and I doing our George Burns and Gracie Allen routine. Um, uh, I want to give her a little gift, okay? So this is being presented um, from SPX to Roz. This was purchased by a friend of ours in India. And he sent it to me to present to Roz for her coming to SPX. And she has no idea what it is, so... <laughs> <laughs> now, if this were my Aunt May, she'd be like carefully, carefully unwrapping so she could use the paper again, but not me. I hope you like it and don't already have it. Signed. Oh, my God. Oh, this is so great. This is... Oh, oh my God. Wow. Um, my, our mutual fan, Chris Wheeler, sent it to me about three months ago to present to Roz. Here, why don't we go ahead and yeah. show them. Oh, yes, this is <laughs> So Roz, Roz is a huge fan of the New Yorker cartoonists and um, collects their work and has their books and things like that. And so Chris found this, sent it to my house, and this is for Roz. Yes. Whitney Darrow, Jr. <laughs> You're sitting on my eyelashes. Yeah, you're sitting on my eyelashes, right, yes, exactly. Yes, titled one of his books, and stop, miss. <laughs> yes. So, uh, okay. Um, so before Roz gets into, you know, showing you all kinds of really cool cartoons, just wanted to talk for a few minutes about um, uh, her career and different aspects of it. And when, when you started at the New Yorker a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, there weren't that many women cartoonists at the time, right? Uh, at the time, there was uh, Nori Carlin, um, and that was it. But it wasn't always that way. There were other, right. uh, at, in other eras at the New Yorker, there was, of course, you know, Helen Hokanson and Mary Petty and Barbara Sherman and others. Uh, but it does seem that in the 50s and the 60s and then to the 70s, the numbers went down. So right. that when I came at the end of the 70s, it was, uh, there was Nuri Carlin, and she only appeared occasionally. It was really 99% men. And, and in terms of the indie comics aesthetic, one of the things that we're, we're proud of here is that we're, we try not to be like what the mainstream has got. And when you saw what was being shown in The New Yorker, and then when Roz's cartoons came along, there was such a contrast. So. Can you, can you speak to how the editors responded to you and then? Well, I was very, I, I was very fortunate, I think, that uh, when I started, maybe they were looking for something that was somewhat different. And uh, I, I think I probably checked several boxes at the same time, you know, being, um, being uh, much younger than the average age of the cartoonist being female, and my work was definitely from a different um, point of view from the other artists, so you know it was sort of like checking three boxes at once. Um, of course, when I was 23, I didn't know any of this. I just kind of wanted to make a living as a cartoonist since it was the only thing I knew that I liked to do and that I could do, um, yeah. And um, it's, it's interesting, the, the body of work, because you, you went from uh, cartooning, okay, and then did, you illustrated a number of books before you did the graphic novels, yeah. which we'll get to in a second. And you also did one or two books of your own, like 
Marco and things like that. So talk about that transition going from the single panel cartoonist out and to be an illustrator yeah. on other people's books and then do some of your own little children's books. I think, I think I've really basically done almost everything. I've done advertising, I've done editorial illustration, um, I've done posters, I've done CD covers, uh, I've done... Of classical music. Classical music. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, cartoon collections, uh, illustrated other people's books, done children's books. Um, basically, I like to work. So. Right, yeah, yeah. It comes in handy. It comes okay. in handy, yes. I like to... And then a couple work. of years ago, you were editor of the Best American Cartoons. Yes. Ed, yeah, right. Talk about that process, because all of a sudden you're not a creator, you're an editor. Well, it was, it was interesting because I really didn't know much at all about the world of indie comics. You know, there were uh, people doing... The, the, I was asked to edit the... Uh, Best American Comics 2016 uh, by Bill Cartolopoulos. And I said, wow, you know, I'd like to do this, but the truth is I don't know much about the world of indie comics. Um, I know, you know, the big names. I know Chris Ware. I know, uh, you know, Dan Klaus. But I don't know, you know, I, I feel a little bit shy about doing this. Um, and he sort of walked and talked me through it. And I was... I became more sort of immersed in this world that I think is kind of what this festival represents more of than the world that I was familiar with. And I loved it. It was really interesting. But making the decisions uh, was was hard because there was so much good stuff. There really was so, so, so much good stuff. But he, uh, Bill sent me, the way it worked was um, he went around the country and went to all these I guess festivals, book festivals like this, and got maybe a thousand books, which he pared down to I think there were 130, and then oh, he, so it was pre-curated before pre, pre-curated oh, okay. down to 130, and then he sent me um, in four different boxes boxes of these books, and I narrowed them down to about 30 that were included. And were there any? Favorites that you saw? Were there any that stuck out at you that now you follow those people? Yes, or? absolutely, absolutely. One thing that was interesting was that uh, when I made my selection, uh, Bill said, I, I'd like you to take another look at a couple of people um, that weren't included that I think bear repeated viewing. And I did, and a couple of them I thought, like, how did I miss this? This is wonderful, you know, because. It just, it, there were things that I did not, I didn't get on the first viewing, but then when I looked at it again, um, I liked it much more. So that was really interesting, just learning how sometimes your first impression, um, you're just wrong, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and, and at that time, weren't you working on one of your own graphic novels? Yeah, uh, well, I'm at this point, I'm kind of almost always working on something. I think when I was doing that, I had already finished the book about that I did about my parents, uh, the Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant, which is the first graphic uh, memoir type, the long form thing I had done. Yeah, I remember seeing you while it was percolating in your head and you had all of these notes and stuff like that that you yeah. were trying to pull together. So, you know, going from, because you, you did these children's books, as the yeah. case may be, Marco, to talk about that process, because that, that's something that, at least to me, because not being artistic at all, going from this single panel or very simply told world into this much more complex world of conveying things in a graphic novel, and how did that whole process kind of percolate, and how did it come out, and how did you kind of deal with uh, this new world that you were in? Um, well, it was, it was hard. It w uh, I, I felt, especially towards the end of the whole experience I had with being the care main care, the only caretaker, really, um, since I, I was an only child of my parents, the book I wrote was about my parents' last 10 or so years. And I knew when I was going through it, it was so, it was just like all new information for me about th this end of life stuff. Uh, everything from just practical aspects like, what's a healthcare proxy? I don't know. To, um, you know, just the emotional aspects of it. And, you know, which were 
unrelenting and just got kind of more and more intense as you know the months passed. Uh, um, this was really you know about my parents' last ten years or so. But then I realized as I was writing it that the story wasn't just about their last ten years. It was really about their relationships with each other, their relationships with me, and I had to give some of the background. Um, because that was important as well. The, the hard, one, the, one of the hardest parts, I think that my work has always had not a purely autobiographical component, but there's always been a little bit of my own story that sort of weaves throughout all of my work. Um, that um, I completely lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, and my shrink no. would say this is because I don't want to say it. No, no, no and, and, and that's okay. <laughs> well, and, and then you went through that process, and then you did it again, but in a very different thing with the second graphic the second. novel, which was really about something that was a gift to your... Yeah, yes, yeah. Um, well, I, I, but to, to get back to my parents' book, the hardest thing in some ways was figuring out how to tell the story, and it really wasn't until, you know, because I had only, I didn't to put, make a long story short, it was uh, my therapist who suggested breaking it into chapters, and I was like, chapters, whoa, I'd never really <laughs> thought about that, you know, because I'd never done a long uh, piece, um, and that made a lot more sense, because then I could sort of jump back and forth in time a little bit. So. And, and your editors, were they part of that whole process? To Not too much. I mean, I think that I work best with a very light hand from an editor, yeah. which is, you know, could also be interpreted as like being given enough rope to hang yourself with. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, they kind of left me on, on my own to figure it out. And then, uh, then I would kind of give them to it at the end. And then they went, I had a wonderful line editor, well, for both books, two different editors, where they kind of tell me when I'm repeating myself, when something doesn't make sense, when I said three weeks here and four weeks there, and like, which was it? And, you know, to just make it make more sense. Um, but yeah, the second book that I did, a graphic memoir, was about, uh, it's called Going Into Town. And it was about, um, uh, well, basically my daughter, uh, went to school in Manhattan, and I'll be talking about this a little more when I show the slides. But right, right. Yeah. And, and, and uh, I made her a little booklet when she went off to school, so it was sort of based on that. And one Manhattan. time I went up to visit her, and she's like, Warren, I want to show you something. And was sitting on the floor of her, I don't know if you remember, we were yeah. sitting on the floor of your studio, and there was a stack of originals about this high, all in the exact size of the book oh. in which it was printed. <laughs> yeah. Warren, check this out. And, you know, she's showing me this and showing me that, and... And, you know, I'm sitting there, I'm going, oh, my God, this is absolutely amazing. And then what, what came out was only some of what I saw. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that there was, it was almost like you did two books. Yeah, well, with all, the, with all the writing, it's the same thing with the cartoons. I mean, what you see in The New Yorker is about, it's just a small fraction of what I produce and what everybody I know. With, with, the, with the New Yorker, you submit every week what for some reason it's called The Batch. And that's like, you know, six, seven, eight, ten cartoons every week. And if you're lucky, you sell one. So you have this, you know, after a while, you build up like this backlog of like thousands of cartoons. Um, don't, don't you have, the, you've got these huge file cabinets, Oh, I right? do, and they're full, so now they're like <laughs> piled up on the top. But that's pretty much what, what we do. Yeah, there's a stack of old-fashioned file cabinets of, yeah. up in her studio that you open, and, and it's stuffed. You like can't put your fingers in the middle to leaf through yeah. any of it? it's a lot of work, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> So um, why, don't, why don't we go ahead and yeah. you know, show some cartoons, I mean, me okay. talking, you want to hear her. All right. okay. I'm going to have to move over to this thing, and hope, hopefully this will work. I'm going uh, uh, to show some slides. Uh, this is Pigeon Little. Um, most, most of these are from The New Yorker. Uh, the sky is falling, the sky is, oh look, part of a bagel. Um, this is the fountain of puberty. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you've ever like hung out in front of like a middle school for any reason, uh, but it's really funny to watch the kids come out, you know. Um, uh, this is when moms dance, and um, a lot of times people ask me like, where do you get your ideas for cartoons? And uh, 
sometimes I really could not tell you, but this one I can absolutely tell you. Uh, when my daughter was around 16, she was doing her homework in the living room, and you know, I, I know that there's almost nothing more revolting in the eyes of a teenager than the sight of an adult human body. Um, <laughs> I mean, in fact, I, I, the New Yorker posted a recent cartoon of mine to Instagram, and it was about shopping for a, a mother of the bride slash groom dress. And I didn't post it to my Instagram. They posted it. And there were some comments for, like, there was a comment by a young woman who said, why are all these women, like, overweight and dumpy? And it's like, honey, this is what 60 looks like, <laughs> you know? I'm not overweight and dumpy. I'm fucking 60 years old, you know? <laughs> Um, so I fully, <laughs> you know, this is not, not anti-woman, this is reality. Um, anyway, uh, so when my daughter was doing her homework, I wanted to see if she was paying attention. And I know I can't dance, but I just wanted to see. So I kind of, she was listening to hip-hop music on the boombox, you can tell how old this is. And I kind of just did this little, you know, kind of dance. And... And she looked up and she said, Mom, stop, you're hurting me. <laughs> and um, I asked her if I could use it in a cartoon and she said, okay. Uh, uh, this is self-help books for the newly dead. Uh, we have five people you should avoid in heaven, eating for eternity, and who moved my urn? <laughs> um, this is the mind-body problem. Uh, I really, I love drawing lamps. I love drawing interiors. To me, a nightmare is, I, once had, I was once illustrating a children's book, and I didn't realize how much I would hate drawing some of these scenes until I was actually doing them, because it took place in the woods. And like, there's nothing more horrible to me than drawing the woods. Um, because, like, I really love detail, and I love, but the detail I know is, like, basically the inside of an apartment type of detail, not, like, a woods detail. So, like, I'd have, you know, these animals in the woods, and then it was like, well, what's on the floor in the woods? Okay, there's, like, some branches. All right, there's some stones, and I'd put a couple of stones, and then a little grass, and it would still look like nothing. It was just like, well, what else is there? Is there like at least a rug or something, you know? Um, but nothing, nothing at all. There's like no wallpaper. It's just woods. It's just horrible. Um, so yeah, anyway, um, this is not in the mood for human interaction line um, at the supermarket. Um, this is just a general sort of declension. We have antiques, collectibles, bric-a-brac, and garbage. Um, sort of, yeah. yeah, that's the way it is. Uh, um, this is insomnia jeopardy, uh, ways in which people have wronged me, strange noises, diseases I probably have, money troubles, why did I do or say that, and ideas for a screenplay. Um, this is a, de a desktop desk joke, I guess. Uh, too early to begin working on and too late to do anything about. Um, uh, this is freelance life. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is the vain but realistic queen. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who, if she lost 10 pounds and had her eyes and her neck done and had the right haircut, could in her age would be the fairest one of all. Um, and I'm sorry if this is offensive to anybody. I really didn't mean it that way. Um, or maybe I did. <laughs> um, this is Nancy Drew Mysteries, the later years. Uh, Nancy Drew and the missing house keys. I know, I left them right there. Nancy Drew and the mystery of the eight pounds. How did I gain eight pounds? I eat nothing. Um, and Nancy Drew and the secret of the computer. You and I are going to be great friends. Um, uh, this is in a just world. Uh, and, I must say, with some shame and some pride, this was the first bitch in the New Yorker, in the cartoons, not in the writing. For some reason, in the writing, they allow people to write anything at all, but not, not so much in the cartoons. You really have to work on them for that. Um, and this is the Holy Trinity. Um, and uh, 
This is a end is near. Um, I love those end of the world guys uh, jokes. Um, don't see as many in New York anymore. Um, and this is a tombstone joke. Uh, yeah, and um, that's the now. Oh, also, I, I I get into these weird like sort of um, hobbies, I guess, uh, obsessions, um, and I I really. Uh, got deeply into uh, Pisanki egg decorating at one point, and I made hundreds of them. Um, I learned the traditional technique from somebody where you uh, melt, you draw the drawings on the egg. It's just chicken eggs, um, and I don't blow the yolks and gook out till later. Um, you draw on the egg with wax with a little tool called a kist key, which is essentially a little tiny brass well with a hole at the bottom of it attached to this little stick thing. And I would pencil the drawing in and then draw on top of the pencil with the wax and then dip the egg into uh, subsequent vats of dye uh, starting from the lightest, which would be white, to the end one, which was generally black. Um, and it's like batik, you're thinking in the negative, which comes very easily to me. Um, and uh, here's some, here's some other ones. Um, it was really, I really loved it. The dyes are just really brilliant, and um, I lo love the colors. Uh, and um, it, it lent itself to my work, I, th I thought. Uh, uh, this was, I also got into rug hooking, um, and this was the first one that I made. I have birds, I like birds, uh, and you can see I'm definitely doing some sexual stereotyping here. Um, uh, the one on the left is my African gray, who's female, and the one on the right is, was my Lori, he passed away. I don't know whether he was a boy or a girl, I always thought of him as a little boy, though. Um, and uh, this is another rug I did. This one was about four by five feet. This is the largest one I did. And this one was actually of my father. He used to have these crazy, crazy breakfasts where he would take everything out of the refrigerator and put it on the table, which would drive my mother insane. Um, and uh, these, like, these foods, like these old country foods, like borscht and shav. I don't know if you guys know what shav is. It's made from buffalo grass. And it looks like, mucus. It's, it's disgusting. And uh, he would pour the shav into, it's the color of like when your kid has a really horrible virus. And this, you know, what we used to call in Park Slope the green 11s. You know, think about it. Um, and, uh, and then he would mix sour cream in with it and cottage cheese and make this sort of soup. It was just stunning. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it was really horrible. Um, but he would just lay out all this, all this stuff. So that that was uh, again. I loved the the color of it. I think made just made me very happy working with all these colors. Um, and I've also gotten this is my latest obsession is um, embroidery. And uh, this is one of my favorite quotes from the uh, Polish poet Czesław Milos. Uh, and when a writer is born into a family, the family is finished. And uh, I think there were no truer words ever spoken by anyone. Um, and uh, this was, I did uh, last year, a cover for The New Yorker. Um, it was their tech issue, which also coincided with Mother's Day. And uh, it's a, I, I think it's the only time they've had a piece of embroidery on the cover. Uh, somebody asked me whether it was an app, and then I hit them. Um, <laughs> No, no, this is, uh, this is hours and hours of purest insomnia. Um, and it's, uh, it's embroidered, it's a motherboard, uh, an imaginary motherboard, because I thought, ha ha, Mother's Day, motherboard. Um, and uh, that's pretty much what that is. And now we're in a different part of the talk, so. Yeah, so we, uh, Roz and I talked, and um, so we, I, I wanted to go ahead and talk with you about you know, your influences and particularly the, you know, some of the New Yorker people that you kind of channeled and, you know, were like, these are my faves. And so yeah. the two we've got, this first one, this is Charles Adams. And oh, by the way, being a collector, I've told her that if her collection of rare Charles Adams glasses are ever missing from her house, they're not <laughs> at my house and don't look for them, okay? 
Gotcha, but you're the one who has the Charles Adams scarf. No, no, I don't have oh. a scarf. I have the plates. The plates. Who has this scarf? I saw a Charles Adams scarf. One. Yeah, in, in early 1951 or 52, someone decided to go ahead and merchandise a bunch of New Yorker cartoonists. And Charles Adams, there's actually a, a spread, I think, in Look or Life magazine. Yeah. And there are scarves. There's a Charles Adams umbrella. There's like, well, there's Charles Adams stuff that no one has ever seen. Yeah. Okay. And that, it's like and, the holy grail of... Stuff. But speaking yeah. of scarves, you have up on your wall, we'll get back to Charles in a minute, yeah. you've got an amazing Otto Sagla one, and yes. then you've got a, uh, was it a Cobain? It's a, yeah, and they are so offensive, you would just not believe it. Um, I mean, they could not be done today at all, but they're quite beautiful. Um, right, just, all right, and then, then I sent you some of those Peter Arno handkerchiefs. Yeah, 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 just great great stuff and uh, and you know these are big so they, yeah. they you know i haven't seen them up on your wall so they oh they, they look great they look great i should have included um yeah they're like the size of those uh paintings in the back there squares and um they're just oh they're here too yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah they're about that size and they're wonderful um so w w let's let's focus yeah. on adams for a minute okay yeah. So I know Adams is one of your yeah. favorites. It's, it's a, it, it, in fact, my, my mother, who didn't laugh a lot, when I was young and collecting the Charles Adams books, I gave her one, and I found her in the living room just chuckling. And yeah. when I looked at the cartoon she was chuckling at, I was like, I don't know if I should be concerned about this or not, <laughs> okay? Well, I, I think for me, Charles Adams, there were a lot of facets to this. I discovered him. My parents subscribed to The New Yorker, so... On some level, I was aware that they used cartoons, but I think when I was little, I'd probably pick up a New Yorker and not really look at it that much because it's so text heavy. But um, when I was little, maybe like seven, eight, nine years old, my parents were school teachers and they used to go uh, to, for some reason, to Cor I think because some friends of them, they would go to Cornell in Ithaca in the summer. Um, they had uh, this whole group of Brooklyn school teachers would go together. Most of them, almost all of them, did not have children. My parents just had me, and they were older when they had me. And they would go up to Cornell, they would live in graduate student housing, and they would go to lectures and concerts and stuff during the day. It was like, to them, culture, and it was. Um, but during the day, if they had something they were gonna do with their other grown up friends, they would park me in the browsing library at Cornell in Willard Strait Hall. I don't know if any of you went to Cornell, but they, they, they had a browsing library. And one section of the browsing library, I can still picture it when you walked in, it was on the right, it was all cartoon books. And I was obsessed with the Charles Adams books, uh, Monster Rally, Adams and Evil, Drawn and Quartered, Black Mariah. Uh, oh my God, I just love them. And I think I partly love them because they were so dark and they were so funny and they were so mean and, uh, and they were so beautiful and they just really spoke to something in me. Um, and also, they had children in them, you know. Uh, they had, the, the, the characters didn't have names when Charles Adams drew them in The New Yorker. They had got names when he did the TV show. But, you know, Wednesday and Pugsley and... Uh, and Lurch and... and yeah, but Wednesday, Wednesday and Pugsley with the, ch with the children. With the children, right, yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I related to it because they, they, were, they were a family. And, uh, you know, as opposed to the cartoons that took place in environments that I knew nothing about, like, you know, boardrooms or cocktail parties or something, you know, to an eight-year-old, a witty remark at a cocktail party is not that interesting. But, like, I definitely got the jokes about children or about husbands and wives. And, and we've got you know, a couple of those to show. Yeah, so yeah. Um, go, go ahead and walk us through these. Okay. <laughs> So there were, there were just the gazillion cartoons okay. from Charles Adams, and we scanned a bunch and yes. chose these, and so... And this one is, uh, um, I guess Gomez is saying, are you unhappy, darling? And she's saying, oh yes, completely. <laughs> um, and this is a very famous one. This one is just called Boiling Oil. And I guess this is what I mean by mean. Uh, I love it so completely with every, every, you know, cell in my body. I love this cartoon. Uh, well, this was going to be a Christmas cover for The New Yorker, but last minute, 
Um, Harold Ross got cold feet about it, and it just became an inside page. Um, but you can sort of see it's the Adams family on the top of their uh, house, and down at the bottom are carolers, and they're about to pour boiling oil all over them. Um, uh, this is, I have to get up close to read it, I'm sorry. Oh, you're right. Hear me back there? Were you able to hear me? Okay. Um, it's just, it's and just great. And there's one of the children ones. Yes, okay. one of the children ones, and you know, it's kids are hostile to each other. You know, I mean, people. You know, uh, oh, I love this. This is. Uh, um, oh, darling, could you just step out for a moment? Um, and I'm sure you guys remember, I, I, don't, I don't think it's included in here, but the one where uh, um, they're going, it, it's a, it's a, a two-way road on a cliff, and um, the guy is saying to pass him, and there's a truck coming, but the other guy can't see it. Uh, I mean, there's just so many great ones. Um, there, I, I think somebody else once said he made, he made sort of a, um, black like goth kind of stuff funny, you know? It's, it's very black humor, which I like a lot. Um, oh, this is good. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, nothing much, what's new with you? <laughs> I guess he liked to draw lamps and interiors too. Uh, you know, just all the detail. I mean, I just love that like he thought to make like the lamp like that, you know? It's just wonderful. Somebody asked me like, what do you, what do you like, what would, do you like to draw? I like lamps. I love drawing the backs of TV sets, you know? Um, the, fake, the fake paintings in cartoons. I mean, it would be great to have a show if somebody just like painted all of the fake paintings in cartoons. Um, and this is, uh, should I? Talk? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, this is this is William Steig, and he was another real influence on me. I mean, I love St uh, Steinberg too, but I'm going to focus on Steig. Steig is a very interesting artist. William Steig, he started out as a very sort of straight, just cartoonist, cartoonist. He had um, a, a books like Small Fry, which were really um, basic straight cartoons about like little kids and their sort of escapades and then there would be a gag line. He also, as opposed to most of the cartoons in, in the New Yorker at the time, um, and these were like, I think he might, might have started in the 30s and 40s, uh, as opposed to most of the cartoonists at that time, he drew sort of lower middle class Jewish life in New York, you know, with like a kind of like a mom and a dad, and you know, the mom was kind of big, and it wasn't like these sort of slick sort of rich people, they were kind of homely, you know. Um, but then he went through all these different phases, which I find absolutely fascinating, because most artists, they kind of, they might expand their range, but they don't radically shift styles. And he went from that sort of basic straight cartooning kind of with a, you know, cartoon and a gag line to he went through Reichian analysis in the 50s. And he started to do these sort of, and this was when uh, psychology and psychiatry were starting to enter the pop cu popular culture, you know, people going to a shrink. And he did these different sort of drawings and let the other stuff go. And I, uh, he did these books that I love so much. And these are some drawings from it. The top drawing is Melancholia. Um, the next drawing is Anxiety. And they're just kind of, I love the style of drawing and I love the sort of, um, I, I don't know, the sort of boiling down of what that feeling is. It's just fantastic to me. Um, possessions. Um, and then he switched his style yet again, and he got like another whole look to his stuff. Uh, family, which is just so great. You know, they're all just shackled together. Um, and uh, the, the parents are, they're kind of looking at each other, they're a little worried. Um, 
they're shackled, but they're not exactly like joyfully bouncing through this whole situation. The kid looks happy, but also worried. You know, like this is kind of weird, is it not? Um, and his feet are not quite on the ground. Like they're really kind of lifting him up. You can see. Uh, this is. Um, Reaction of disgust, which I love. I mean, who hasn't had this happen to them? Um, and uh, conviction of being unique, which is kind of fantastic. It's just great. Um, and guilt. And this is, again, this different style. Um, and... Uh, Quiet evening at home, and uh, you know he he had a very interesting and uh, kind of melancholy take, I guess, on on marriage. Not you know that it's all great or that it's all terrible, but that there's a kind of melancholy aspect to being in any any long term relationship. And and you know I don't know. I got the feeling though that he sort of sensed that maybe it was better than being alone but that it was still, you know, up for debate. Um, so. That's it. Now we'll, we'll yeah. do some question and answer. And do we have microphones? Or we could repeat the question. It's not, or. I, I think we're, think we're semi-prepared. Oh. <laughs> yeah, there. Oh, There's okay. a microphone there. So questions? No one has a question for Roz? Yeah. Mr. Lutz. Little, I'm sorry. Little. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, hi. Um, uh, were all those Adams cartoons full page? Um, I don't think so. I know the boiling oil one was, and but you've done, you've done some full page. Cartoons yes. Yes. I, I long for a resurgence for that. Do you feel like with the new cartoon editor, there could be a renaissance of full page cartoons? I, I, the question was about full page cartoons and whether I hoped with the new editor there would be a resurgence of full resurgence of full page cartoons. The, the problem is to state the obvious paper is going away. And uh, there's just not as much real estate, paper real estate as there once was. So uh, on the back page, you know, before the cartoon caption contest, that used to be a space for full page cartoons, but um, not so much anymore. Uh, it really, it's economics. Um, yes. Uh, there's a oh, no, microphone. No, I, I can repeat it. Oh, okay. It takes All right. So long. Can yeah. we do it that way? Okay. Yeah. Don't go to the microphone. Just, I'll repeat the question. I just want to point out, I love the ones you do with a lot of friends on the full page, and that's, you know, when I, I did the full page, it's, it's probably still there. Yeah. And it's a full page. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was just about the, fu the full page. I don't know if you heard it over there. I'll repeat it. Just uh, again, we, we love full pages. We do, but you know, yes. Yes. Well, as I told my editor, uh, this is about my parents' book, um, I, I felt like the, it should be on the travel shelf because I felt like when I was g dealing with my parents in this whole part of life, I felt like I was visiting a part of a part of life that I had never been to before and that's really not talked about that much. Like, I had never heard the term healthcare proxy. I knew nothing about uh, you know, power of attorney. I mean, boring stuff like this. Why should I know about it beforehand? But I just knew nothing about it. And I knew not, I mean, I'd never rented an ambulette for anybody. Just, I'd never visited certain aisles in, in the uh, CVS before, you know, and now I know what these things are. And, uh, but it's, it's weird. It's just kind of like, uh, there's like a, a kind of like a barrier between, um, most of this culture and what happens when you are no longer part of that this culture. And I think a lot of it, again, it's economics. It's like, you know, maybe these people aren't 
out buying like a million products, so you know they're not consumers. So who cares about them? Yes. There are filing cabinets full of unpublished yeah. masterpieces of yours, and uh, I'm going to take it for granted that they're all masterpieces. <laughs> you uh, shouldn't. <laughs> uh, have you considered digitizing and put them all on Instagram or start a blog or something? Um, did you guys all hear this? Okay. Um, I post stuff to Instagram, but not that stuff. Um, I, I, I use it for different things. I mean, sometimes there are, car they're, believe me, they're not all masterpieces. A lot of them I just wind up tearing up because I think, like, I can't believe I submitted this. This is just the worst garbage anybody in the world has ever made. Rip, you know. Or it's just terribly dated and, you know, it's like some joke about... I don't know who, whatever, something from the 19, you know, late 1980s or something, it doesn't matter anymore, people are all dead. Um, uh, but uh, I just feel like it's, I, no, I, I wouldn't bother digi digitizing them. Um, I use them sometimes, uh, I do resubmit reject sometimes, I like to, you know, I was talking about the batch before and like submitting, you know, six, seven, eight cartoons every week, I often go through that work and there's always a few cartoons that I really love that they've rejected and I can tell how many times because on the back I write down when I've submitted it and to whom. So some of them like I've submitted like three or four times over the years and I usually try to rework it in some way to, uh, you know, sell it. <laughs> yes. Is there any chance that any of the cartoons that you love that haven't been uh, re-accepted by the New Yorker might be published in some separate context outside of the New Yorker? Um, every once in a while, you know, there's that book, The Rejection Collection. Um, so there are things like that, or somebody might put a, out a book on, you know, book cartoons or something like that. So yeah, yeah. Um, Ellen, oh. I'm gonna take Ellen over here. Okay. Uh, hi, Roz. Hi. Uh, I have yeah. a question about... I love your work. Thank you. <laughs> um, I have a question about... Oh, and thank you for the blurb. Oh, um, <laughs> anyway, so, uh, so I have a question about your process. I know I follow you on Instagram, and you've been playing with digital media. Yeah. I think of you yeah. as very traditional media and very paper and pen-oriented, yeah. so I'm wondering how that's going and what you think. Oh, I am in love with the Apple Pencil so much. I mean, it is definitely my my new husband. Um, I I love 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 uh, the Apple Pencil and the iPad. I have not done um, cartoons for the New Yorker on it. No, actually, I did one. I did one. Um, in general, I like paper and pen too. I mean, I like them both, but it has some really fun aspects, uh, like. I, I did a cartoon on the I, on the train coming down here, and it was really fun. I was able to put color in it and everything, and it wasn't like, oh, I see you're an artist because you have all your paints out there. <laughs> it's like you you can just kind of be like quietly in your own world, kind of drawing, and it, it, it's just it it's really kind of fun. And you so. did the title slide. Yeah, I did this, yeah. the title. Yeah, well, the, I did the title slide on it, and and so there are, are things. I just think of it as another thing to kind of play with, um, and it's definitely fun. You should, yeah. I mean, the, you know, you get a. Let's do two more questions. Oh, okay, we should do the, somebody on that side was raising their hand, but I don't know. oh yeah. Can, can you just say a word about your creative process as regards wallpaper? Oh. <laughs> yeah, wallpaper, I would say that falls into the same category as like lamps and tables and uh, coffee tables and, and couches and chairs and clocks and, and things on the walls. I think for me, drawing a scene is like, I, I want you to feel that um, you could open up the drawer in, in the coffee table and you'd know what was inside of it. Um, one time I read this interesting thing about, about Disney and Walt Disney and he said, 
that you should always put more details in a scene than anybody can take in when they're watching the movie because that's what makes it like life. And I guess I'm lucky because I love to draw, I love detail and I really like doing it, but it also to me, um, I'm not like a minimalist. There are, I was talking with a friend earlier about like, you know, minimalist cartoonists, I think of like, you know, Charles Barsotti, where his setting is just basically a horizon line. Um, I like, I like the wallpaper, I like, I, I, wanna, I wanna draw everything, basically, um, which is maybe not so good, um, because as the cartoons get smaller, it just gets like stupider and more pointless, but um, I, li I like doing it anyway, so. Okay, one, one more question. Oh, wait a minute. Things. Oops, sorry. What's one of the most surprising things you've learned about cartooning over the years? Um, well, it's, it's actually two things. One is just personal. The most surprising thing is the fact that um, The New Yorker decided to publish my cartoons in the first place because I was so not expecting that and I was so not um, thinking that's what was going to happen. My goal was actually to be a cartoonist for The Village Voice. Um, and I dropped my cartoons off at the New Yorker, fully expecting them to be rejected. I didn't even have my hopes up. Um, so that was the biggest complete shock. Um, but the other surprise was finding out, um, and this is a little sad, um, that the old time cartoonists, that they didn't all, in fact, most of them did not write their own gags. That there used to be gag writers and the people who drew the gags. Peter Arno did not write gags. Charles Adams wrote some, but he bought tons of them. Um, and so that's how it used to be done back in the old days, that there were gag writers and there were artists. Um, in fact, when I first started, I used to get pa packets of gags from people, and I would think, these people have never seen my cartoons, because it would be like, two guys at a bar, blah, 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 blah. you know, and be like, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, <laughs> and I'd send them back, you know, thanks a lot, but I generally write my own cartoons. <laughs> um, but yeah, so okay. that, two surprising things. <laughs> All right, well, I want to thank everybody for showing up, and of course, thank Roz for gracing us. <laughs> Thank you.